Good evening, saints. I greet you all in the wonderful and precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is a great privilege to be speaking to the Bride of Christ. It is the 21st of July, 2021. We are on our series on demonology. This is Demonology 2021, Part 15. We've been through the physical realm and the religious realm as uh, it is put out in the message uh, preached by the prophet. And <clears throat> we are now getting into the third part, which is a simple message called Enticing Spirits. And this is going to be part one of that. And we'll break it down like we did with the other um, messages. So for a title, Lean Not to your own understanding. And we're going to take our scripture reading from Second Chronicles 18, verse 18 to 22, and also James chapter 1, verse 13 to 14. Let's read Second Chronicles 18, 18 to 22. Again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne, and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left, and the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake after this manner, and another saying after that manner. Then came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. Now if you know the story, um, there is this king Jehoshaphat, and there is Ahab. And the Bible said that Jehoshaphat had riches, and honor in abundance, and he had made leagues with Ahab. And if you read in verse 2, it says, And after certain years he went down to Ahab to Samaria. Uh, so Jehoshaphat goes to Ahab into Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance. That means Ahab made this amazing feast. Now watch this carefully, because we're going to talk about this just now. Ahab made this amazing feast, and look at the words, and for the people that he had with him, so uh, Ahab made a feast for Jehoshaphat and his people. And the word says, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So the scripture is giving us the hint that Ahab used this magnificent feast and this ability to uh, feed all the people and put out the most amazing function or party for Jehoshaphat to persuade him to go with him to Ramoth Gilead. And it seemed like whatever Ahab did kind of worked because Jehoshaphat said, you know, we are friends, we are political friends, and if you are going to war and you need backup, I'm there with you. But then Jehoshaphat, being a kind of spiritual man, said to Ahab, hold on, can we at least ask from the Lord whether it is his will that we go? And so Jehoshaphat is asking for a prophet. And so Ahab admits that there is no prophet in the land that they know except one prophet whose name is Micaiah, the son of Imla. He said, but this Micaiah, he, he always prophesies against anything I do. So Jehoshaphat actually says to the king, it doesn't matter. Let's get him in here anyway. So when Micaiah comes in and he says, and they ask him, shall we go and take Ramoth Gilead? They explain the situation. Micaiah kind of mockingly says to the king, yeah, of course, you know, go ahead. Go and take it. The Lord says it's yours, you know. And then Ahab says, you see, I told you this guy is going to mock me. He's going to tease me and speak evil against me. So Ahab says one more time, how many times have I told you to, to say nothing else but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? So then Micaiah breaks out into this prophecy and parable. Now, the reason why I'm telling you it's a parable and prophecy, because you, you see Micaiah saying a thing like, he sees that the Lord is asking for something to, to come and entice Ahab 
to go to Ramoth Gilead so he will fall. And um, this is because the prophets of Ahab had already said that the way is set, the, um, they prophesy that God is in this move, they must go to Ramoth Gilead. And um, so Micaiah showed them this parable to say that God knew what was happening and that there is a lying spirit in these prophets. And of course, you know, they take Micaiah and throw him in prison and um, they decide to go anyway. But what is amazing in the scripture is it says they came out a spirit and stood before the Lord. So the Lord allowed an enticing spirit to come into the prophets for them to speak something in the name of the Lord to say the Lord has blessed us. And the, what we're seeing here is that God allowed it to come into a group of religious people who worshipped God. They were not prophets of Baal. They were prophets of God. They were men with, with actual gifts. And God al allowed an enticing spirit to come into them so that it could bring the downfall of Ahab. So that's an important point here. All right, so let's get to the next scripture, which is James chapter 1, verse 13 to 14 says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So this is an important thing to understand. God does not himself tempt you. A tempt means to lead you specifically into a trap. But what he can do is allow something to happen where an evil spirit can come up to tempt you. And there again, it is for the purpose of your spirit being tested. It is not that you are going to be forced to go into this fall. You still have a choice, right? Verse 14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now that lust meaning your desires. So what it's telling us is that you will be enticed by an enticing spirit because of something that is already occurring inside you, which is a part of your lust. Now lust means desire, right? Desire. So simply strong desire for something is the reason why you can be enticed. All right. So the Lord had a blessing to his word. Let's start with an important quote at the beginning of this very message. Paragraph 14, Enticing Spirits, 1955, 24th of July. Now, the way we try to follow it here at the tabernacle, Brother Bram is saying, it's the only place in the world that I go that I preach doctrine, is here at the tabernacle because this is our church. Now, here it is, saints. And we preach doctrine here to keep the people lined up. Okay, remember that. We're going to refer to this later. Other men in their churches, they preach whatever they believe. And they're my brothers. And we might differ a little bit, but we're still brothers just the same. And here in the tabernacle, we preach what we think is scriptural doctrine. So this is an amazing statement. We preach doctrine here to keep the people lined up. Preaching doctrine is what we do in the local church to keep the people in line. What do we mean by keeping the people in line? That's not talking about ruling the people. That's not speaking of making sure they follow our laws. That simply means to keep the people in line with God's word, in line with the correct understanding of things, to bring them more powerful in revelation. Amen. That's the reason why we preach doctrine. And we'll get into this a little later or refer to a little later. Now let's get to paragraph 37 as we begin to understand what enticing spirits is all about. And we'll take just a small section of it for today's service. Now, just from the beginning, I want to apologize a little bit because of the events of this week and the situation that we are dealing with as a family. I must apologize because I have not comprehensively written out my notes the way I, sh I usually do for you just purely because of the lack of time, but I'm trusting the Lord that He can, uh, that you can gain as much from uh, without uh, from the message without comprehensive notes written out for you. Paragraph 37. 
Now, knowing in the church and our tabernacle, and I want to speak on enticing spirits, which is would be really titled demonology. So notice enticing spirits would be really titled demonology. So he says, so you, you hear so much about demons of these days, but you hear so little about how to get rid of it. We, are, we all are well aware that there's devils, but the next thing is how to get rid of that. And now here, now there is having, by the grace of God, much opportunity to deal with these things called demons and meeting them at the platform and in daily walks. And I'd like to look into the scripture this morning to find out just what those things are. So what we see immediately is that we identify from this quote that the prophet identifies enticing spirits as demonology. He says, you you might as well title it demonology. So Demonology equals enticing spirits. Enticing spirits equals demonology. Okay, so he also says that in this, what we learn is, uh, he says, from his experience, you get to talk about demonology, demon possession, devils and stuff and things, spirits that you meet at the pulpits, at the platform when you're praying for the sick uh, and so on. And you, you hear a lot of talk about it, but what you really want to know is a little bit, more wisdom and how to get rid of that thing. Okay, so to begin with, what we want to do is understand what entice actually means. So to put it plainly, entice means to persuade deceitfully. All right, and then breaking that down further, persuade deceitfully means to convince someone by pressurizing with a thought that there is some kind of gain for them, that there's something good that's going to come out for them. Okay, if you take the the, the dictionary meaning of entice, it is a verb. It means to attract or tempt by offering pleasure or advantage. So usually if someone has to entice you, the pleasure or advantage they have offered you has an evil lie attached to it. So Giving an example, if somebody wants you to do something for you, they're going to have to paint you a picture of, uh, you know, using their words to tell you this is really good for you. If you do this, you are going to benefit from it. And if you if you do this, if you get in, involved in this or you make this for me or you buy this for me or s- something or the other, You are the one that's going to win here. You know, there's an advantage for you. And trust me, you're going to enjoy this. You're really going to love this, right? That's what using uh, uh, enticement actually means. It's almost a kind of beguiling, a kind of seduction kind of meaning. If something is good for you and beneficial, if something is truly good for you and beneficial, you don't need to entice anyone. Enticing is not necessary. So that is why if someone has to entice you into something, usually there is some kind of deceit behind it and definitely an evil lie attached to it. And if there is an evil lie attached to it, it is demonology 101. Be careful. All right. Paragraph 38. Enticing spirits. The prophet says, now we've applied it in a healing service. Always to the healing side, cancer, tumor, cataract, tuberculosis. All those things are not natural things. They are supernatural and are demons. The scripture plainly vindicates that. But that is demons in the body with growths like cancer, got life in it, and the life of that is a demon. Growth of a cataract, the spread of tuberculosis and other disease, it's demons. That's in physical form. Right? Look at that. We've done that in the physical realm a few weeks ago. He's actually showing how that sicknesses like that are actually demons in a physical form. Right? You know, people often think of demons being, you know, monsters of the past, myths and things that you hear about from the Greek mythology and so on. But the prophet is actually saying that these these kind of diseases that manifest themselves as tumors and growths in the body are actually demons in physical form. And uh, we discussed that at great length in the physical realm. Now he says, well, of course, we know we, we've just been through the religious realm as well. But now let's continue reading. He says, now this morning, 
We're going to talk about demons in spiritual form in the soul. And then he says, they're in the soul as same as they are in the body. And we're bound to admit that we see them in people's bodies, such cancers and different diseases that's in the human body. He said, just recently, even cancer has been declared to be a fourth dimension disease. That's in another dimension. Sure, it's demonology. Every disease is a fourth dimension disease, the beginning of it. Now, I want to explain that first, that statement first. Fourth dimension disease, of course, he's not referring to the dimensions that we uh, taught earlier. Fourth dimension does not mean that the disease comes from the ether. What he really means is in, in science, obviously Brother Branham had read that in that time. In science, they, say, they were claiming there's a realm of study that claims that the disruption of the normal human body clock has high links to why cancers occur. If I, if I could explain that, if any of you know things like that, there's a study about the, what we call the circadian rhythm. Everything in this life uh, operates around the circadian rhythm, for example. And it's, it's got to do with light and darkness, um, day and night. So it's, it, it works with light. And your brain has uh, that circadian rhythm uh, uh, programmed in it from the time you are a baby, from the time you were a child, you start to develop that. The birds have it, the creatures, all creatures in the world have it, and they all function according to sunrise and sunset. So what happens is, when light starts to appear in the morning, your brain receives a trigger and, and starts to let out a hormone to wake you up, to move your bladder, uh, then start moving you through the day, then start to make you hungry, then start to make your bowels move. And then as the day progresses and you reach the nighttime, when you reach sunset and light becomes uh, uh, dim and then you go into darkness, then the body now will switch into another mode and send out a hormone that starts making you tired and yawn and want to go to sleep. And that very basically is called the circadian rhythm. That's the reason you find Everything goes quiet around about nighttime. The birds all sit still in their trees. They go into roosting. They are absolutely controlled by the circadian rhythm. And then the night insects begin because they're working opposite. And some of the nocturnal creatures, the circadian rhythm works opposite to them. They become more active at night and they sleep during the day. If we didn't have that circadian rhythm working for us, um, there would be a lot of chaos in the world. Now, what they're saying when they say a fourth dimension disease, they discovered that because um, we have disrupted that circadian rhythm in our life, it, they feel that it has led to, there are great links to it, to why cancers and tumors occur. Now, Brother Branham's understanding of the fourth dimension that science was referring to is from a different approach. When he says the beginning of a disease is the fourth dimension, it's because he's picked up on that thought and it's because he understands that this disease starts from something behavioral, right? It's because they start with a lie. That's why he knows that it's got to do with demons. So what caused the lie? What caused you to break the, the uh, circadian rhythm? What causes you to break the original uh, workings of nature. See, science can only treat, not cure. Science can never pre prevent diseases from reoccurring, right? So the lie causes breaks in the original nature of things, and nothing science can do can prevent these things from happening. Science is actually partly responsible by being used by the fifth dimension to entice people into a lifestyle that breaks from the original nature of things. See, science has created electricity to make us stay awake longer than we should. We should all be sleeping when the sun goes down. We should not have electricity keeping us up till 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. We should not be having night shift working. We should not be doing things after the sun goes down. And if we didn't, if we had 12 hours of sleep, uh, we'd be fantastically healthy people. 
uh, our bodies would process cancers out. And that is an absolute medical fact. Because that's what happens when your body is in rest mode. It does self-healing, which in the Bible is called salvation. Self-healing, right? But the main discussion here is demonology in the soul realm. That's what we see from this quote. Okay, so devils in the soul realm. What are we talking about? Now, we've seen devils in the different realms. Devils in the soul realm present an entirely different behavior and a mental torment that we have not yet looked at. Okay, we've looked at demonology in the physical realm and the religious realm, and we've seen some of the effects and how great and catastrophic they are for different parts of life. But in the soul realm, it is the kind that takes control of the deepest part of a person's being. And it's not the rational part. It's not the the brain part. It's the seat of a person's desires. That's what we're looking at. That's why it's so dangerous. It's a part where you're not reasoning. You're not thinking about it. It's something that has gotten inside controlling your desires or the biblical word for it, lusts. Okay, so just to explain that, and I've done this in another series a long time ago, um, lusts actually means uh, desires for, uh, for simple things, like, for example, for food, uh, for water. You know, if, if you become really dehydrated and you feel like drinking water or you'd kill someone, that's a lust for water. And you get a lust for food if a person is gone hungry for many days. So what it speaks of is deep desires. Now, take a a situation where someone is so desiring something, and if you put it in their reach, you can get them to do basically anything they want for you because they're so desiring that thing You can convince them any way you want to. How do we know this? Take the example of Jacob and Esau. When Esau went out hunting and he didn't come back successful from the hunt, but he was so tired, he was so hungry to the point of death. I don't think the scripture does justice to describe what he was feeling. I mean, I often thought about it. Why would he come and his brother's cooking pottage at the fire And he's willing to sell his birthright just for pottage. That obviously means that he must have been so hungry to the point of death that he he felt like he had to eat or he was going to die. And that's why Jacob was able to bargain with him and get him to sell his birthright, his firstborn right for a meal of pottage. Amazing. So that's a perfect example, a scriptural example of how a person can be enticed because there is a lust which can be appealed to. Okay, so that's an important thing to understand when you look at enticing spirits. You, in other words, quite simply, you can't be enticed if there's by something you are not desiring. Do you get it? All right. Let's go to paragraph 41, Enticing Spirits. Now, but now cancer in the body or cancer in the soul, the demon can come in in either place. Now, there's many times and many peoples with good thoughts and that and good people who try many times to rest upon some little theology they have or something that they have been taught since a child and still find that down in their being, down in their soul, that they still have something that's not right. Many are here this morning, no doubt. Wherever you find Christians gathered together, you find people who have those spirits in them, that they it's undesirable. That means they don't really want them. He, he says they don't want them. They say, oh, if I could only quit lying, if I could only quit lusting, if I could only quit this or that. He says, now that is devils. Now they come in, in the form of religion many times. Of course, so we're just taking quotes from here and there, but we're trying to build a point for you. You'll have to read the message in the context to see exactly why the prophet was saying those things. But we are taking these quotes to build up a foundation for you to understand enticing spirits. Now, what we see in this quote, the errors that we make, 
The, the things that he says are undesirable. I want to quit lying. I want to quit this. I want to quit that. Those errors that we make are brought about because we are enticed into doing things, these things that are undesirable, by demonology. Every time you do something that is undesirable, whether it is lying, whether it is lusting, whether it is drinking, smoking, cursing, fighting, temper, uh, you know, lust for earthly goods, whatever it is, fornication, whatever it is, at the point that you are enticed by demonology, you have to understand, you can only be enticed if there is a lust or a, a deep desire in there. Now, oftentimes, that desire does not necessarily mean you want the thing that you were enticed into. It could simply mean there is an emptiness, there's a lacking of something. You don't understand what that desire is. You don't un- Like, for example, let's say you're lusting, you're so dehydrated, all you want is liquids, right? You're so needing liquids. And the first liquids that you come across is somebody who has alcohol. Now that time, let's, ex- let's assume you, are, you came out of a desert and the only liquid they have is alcohol. What are you going to do? Whether you're a believer or not, right there your body has lost all control. What it wants is hydration. It's not going to bother. And this person, maybe this person knows you and knows that you don't drink alcohol. Maybe you were an alcoholic who was, who was um, you know, come off it and never trying to go back to it. But here you are, come out of a desert and, you know, God forbid, and you were dehydrated and you need a drink. And what they have is wine or some alcohol there. Are you really going to say no to liquid that can take away your dehydration? You see, so that's a very simple example just to show you that you can really be enticed and go against your own will because there is a desire there. And that's what the enemy knows. He knows what your desire is. Therefore, he can entice you. Okay, now there are many people or there are people who come in among us and who are living under this condition because They are being driven by demonology. There are people among us who can see what our desire is because there there is a spirit living in those people. And they come in among us because they want to entice us in different directions to distract us from our faith. How can I say this? Right? Why can I say this? Well, for example, why would the lying spirit in 2 Chronicles, not come into Micaiah. He was a prophet with a genuine gift. What about those other 400 prophets? Right? They were prophets with a genuine gift, and why would that spirit come into them? It's because those prophets had a desire to be recognized. They had a desire to be recognized by the king. They had a desire for money. They had a desire to be to have fame. They had a desire for Ahab to respect them. And even though they had a genuine gift of prophecy, which could be used of God, because they had a lust, a desire, that is why the devil, the lie, the lying spirit could come into them to be used, right? So this is the thing. The people who come, I mean, you know, Why would a place have 400 prophets in the first place? That already is scary. Okay. Uh, So anyway, one prophet should be good enough. Why 400? Right? So the point is, those prophets came in because they already had an agenda. And they must have come in years ago. And of course, the enemy knew that he could use them and they came in because they wanted something from the people okay so we may not be demon possessed those of us that get enti- that get enticed we may not be demon possessed but being able to be enticed is even worse much more difficult to deal with most times we cast blame on ourselves for the things we do and we feel dejected and defeated because every time we make a mistake we 
we hate ourselves, we blame ourselves for it. But what we should really blame ourselves for, if we're going to do any casting of blame, what we should blame ourselves for and realize that, and what our focus should really be on, is why we are giving way to enticing spirits. Why we are surrendering our free will to enticing spirits. Okay, enticing spirits come in all form, from the outside world, from families, and from the religious realm that we worship under. And as always, everything else is not as deadly as the enticement that comes in a religious realm to make you believe the wrong thing. Okay, so, you know, you can get enticed by Hollywood, you get enticed by the fashions of the world, by riches and all of that. But something that, get, that can entice you to do something in the church realm, in the message, entice you into something that is wrong, that is the most dangerous enticement. All right, let's go to paragraph 42. Now, in the scripture, he's saying, Once there was a man by the name of Jehoshaphat, a great man, a religious man. He went over to another king, which was king of Israel, uh, and he, Jehoshaphat, being the king of Judah, he went down to Ahab, the king of Israel. So there's Brother Branham giving us a little bit of the story. And they all buckled up together and made an alliance with one another to go fight up at Ramoth Gilead. And they did it without first praying. Oh, if people could only realize. That's why I come this morning. I ask you to remember me as I go overseas. In all these things, pray. In all things, pray. Someone come the other day and said, Brother Branham, do you think it's wrong to do a certain thing? Okay, so here's the thing we want to look at now. Brother Branham said, I said, what are you questioning about? See, if there's a question in your mind, leave it alone. Don't do it at all. Just stay with that. When you start to do anything, and if it's a question, whether it's right or wrong, stay away from it. Don't go into it at all. Then you know you're right. He says, now all things ought to be considered prayerfully first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. I am positive, sure this morning, if men and women could only get into the position of where their soul, their thinking, their attitudes would be perfect in the sight of God, that would be one of the most powerful churches that ever existed. Praise be to God. All right. So we have to be careful with the statement that the prophet made. That statement that says, if there's a question in your mind, don't do it. All right? Why? Because there are always questions in our mind. And if you apply this statement as a law, you will end up not doing anything if you have a question in your mind about everything. You might as well just sit at home and do nothing because humans have questions about everything. Right? So that's not what it means. There are some things that we are about to do when there is a question about whether it is morally right or not, that's a clear-cut case. Right? If, if you're asking if it's morally right or not, just don't do it. If there's a business deal and it looks unethical, there's a question in your mind, don't do it. Don't get involved in it. If somebody asks you to, to speak something on their behalf and you know there's a lie attached to it, you know it's morally wrong, there's a question don't do it. As long as the question occurs in your head, that's warning bells, that's alarms going off, don't do it. Those are the clear-cut morality questions that you face every day, and that's where you can apply this, right? Now, if there's a, a question in your mind about what color to paint your house or what car to buy, that's not the same thing. That's not, you can paint your house, you know, neon green, it doesn't matter. It's your choice. You can buy whatever car you want to. It's your choice. It's not the same thing. In the spiritual, it works more dangerously. There was a question in Jehoshaphat's mind. Do we take Ramoth Gilead or not? And is it the will of the Lord? Okay, so in that day, the voice of God was the prophet of that day. They should have known that if God wanted... He, Jehoshaphat, should have known if God wanted them to take Ramoth Gilead, he would have sent, thus saith the Lord, through his prophet, so they wouldn't even have had a question, should we go and take it? Because if God wanted it, he would have told them, 
go and take it. Okay, so the problem is, what we see here, the problem is, the attraction of taking Ramoth Gilead was already there. Right? Why? Because the conditions looked so favorable. At the time, it seemed like, wow, Jehoshaphat thinking, Ahab and myself combining forces, we're so powerful, the time is right, Ramoth Gilead doesn't, will not suspect anything, politically, strategically, it looks like we can just go there and take the war, win the battle. This looks like a definite win, and it looks desirable, like, Okay, if we do this, we can expand our territory. We can control the situation in this region. We can control the politics in this region. Which means he didn't wait upon the Lord. He knew God didn't send a prophet to say, go and take Ramoth Gilead. But he was forcing the issue. Right? Now that's what we always do in this life. We're forcing the issue with these spiritual things. When God hasn't even brought the leading for it yet. That's the problem. Okay. So he was just desiring to win this battle and get it over with. And and felt life would be so much easier. It looks so favorable in his mind. And that's the problem. So already having this feeling, which we call desire or lust, an enticing spirit comes up. When you already have desire, and that indicates a weakness to exploit. If you already have a desire for something, that's a weakness to exploit. And listen, brother, if you already have a desire, your wife is going to sense it, your children is going to sense it, your brothers, your sisters, your family, your mother, your father, whoever it is, your friends, they're going to... The moment you say, I really want something, and they see you reading up something, or they see you researching something, if somebody knows... There's something that you want. When you reveal desires, your deep desires of your heart to anybody, you become some somebody that somebody else can exploit because you now have a weakness. Whenever you have something that you deeply desire, immediately you have a weakness someone can exploit if they know what your true desire really is. In this day, We do not have a living major prophet on the earth. Neither is every life answer directly given to us in the message. However, revelation is given and you have to receive the spirit of that revelation in you to receive an answer from God about anything. Right? So here's where it gets complicated. Listen carefully. Now, most of us will say, but why do I even have a question in my mind about it? Okay? Why do I have a question in my mind about it? That means, why do I even have to decide, you know, whether it's right or not? Why do I even have the question in my mind that, is this right or not? Shouldn't I be somebody who just knows so much what is right that I will never even have the question? Well, let me put your mind at ease. There will not be a question in your mind if you don't have the Spirit of God in you when something wrong comes up, when an option that is wrong comes up for you to do. See, let me explain that. If you are of the devil, wrongdoing won't be a question. (laughs) Do you understand that? If you are already controlled and taken by the devil, you're not going to have a conscience and say, hold on, hold on, is this right or not? See, In the case of Ahab, he was already taken. He didn't ask for the prophet's opinion. It was Jehoshaphat. Which means Jehoshaphat was the godly man in the situation. Jehoshaphat didn't need the... uh, I mean, Ahab didn't need to hear from Micaiah. He already wanted to go. His mind was made up. But Jehoshaphat wanted to hear from God. And that proves that the Spirit of God was in Jehoshaphat. Right? And that's why he had... Now, so if you are of the devil, wrongdoing won't be a question. You'll just, you don't need to check with anybody. You're just going to go ahead and do it because you are already infected with the wrong spirit. Now, that's why the safest thing then is when you have a question, it means something from the spirit of God is giving you conviction in your heart and 
It's simple. Don't do it until you get an answer from God. Right? So the problem here in this situation was the answer from God apparently came through those 400 prophets. And Ahab convinced Jehoshaphat that it was from God by simple mathematics. Jehoshaphat, look, you got 400 guys saying it's of God. And this one fellow who hates me saying it's not of God, who are you going to believe? Okay, so remember James 1, 13 to 14. God does not tempt us. We are tempted because the devil takes occasion of the desires within us. In the case of Jehoshaphat, God allowed the devil. Now listen, Jehoshaphat is a godly man. Why should God have allowed the devil to tempt him? Because it wasn't about Jehoshaphat. You may question that. But that wrong decision made by Jehoshaphat cost him the battle, but it got rid of the main devil who was enticing him, and that was Ahab. Okay, because if you look at this from the very start, it was actually Ahab that was trying to entice Jehoshaphat. Let's get to paragraph 46. Watch just a few moments on the physical. Now, we have many times... Half a years, we got what we call a lie detector. You can put it on your wrist, set it across your head. You can get it in there and try your best to make a lie sound like the truth. It'll register negative every time. Because a human was not made to lie. Amen. A human was not made to lie. Lying is a deceitful, hard thing, evil thing. I'd rather have a drunkard with me any day than a liar. A liar. You see, saints, that's the reason I'm so severe on lies and people not telling the truth. It's because I absolutely believe, based on everything the prophet has taught us, that demonology begins with lies. Right? Now I hear he's saying, And your body was, wasn't made to lie. No matter how sinful you are, you're still a fallen son of God. The most sinful person in the city today, God didn't intend you to be sinful He wanted you to be a son or daughter of his. You're made up in his own makeup. But sin has caused you to do that. And no matter how much you try to impersonate and try to make a lie seem right, they got a scientific instrument that proves that it's wrong. You can tell it with all the innocence you want to, but it'll still register negative because there's a subconscious down in a human being and that subconscious knows the truth. Or what's truth? No matter what you're saying out here, that subconscious knows that it's a lie. It'll register off the subconscious. So notice how your body is not able to handle these situations that the Spirit of God is questioning. See, when you are telling a lie with your mouth, your body is shouting out that you are lying. Your eyes may shift around awkwardly. Your palms and your forehead may become sweaty. Your feet may shift around unsteadily. Your skin may become flushed. Your speech may falter. Your hand may cover your mouth every now and then while you're speaking. Or you may fold those those hands defensively or across them in front of you. Your heart rhythm changes. Your blood pressure may increase. You may get nervousness that makes you want to use the toilet. There are so many things that your body reacts with just because you are trying to tell a lie. Depends on the severity of the lie, depends on who you are talking to, but it's quite easy for someone who is, who is educated in this, who is skilled in this, to know when you are lying. And usually, any person who doesn't even have discernment somehow has this instinct to sense that they cannot trust what you are saying. They may be polite to you and say, oh, okay, but then walk away from you, noting in their heart that, oh, that guy... He's not trustworthy at all. I don't trust anything that came out of his mouth. See, that's because a human spirit can actually tell. So when you are assured and confident of what you're doing, you are not nervous and and wary of anything. You don't really care what people would say. Because if you have the truth, your body will not react in all these weird ways. Because you have nothing to hide. There's no reason to lie when you have the truth. Okay, let's move on. So the problem that we face nowadays is intellectual faith. And that's 
the reason I'm bringing this in is because if you have revelation, you already have a protection against enticing spirits. So even if you have certain lusts and desires, revelation is going to protect you from enticing spirits. But if you have lusts and desires, the same as another person, and you have intellectual faith, well, now you have a problem. Because enticing spirits is going to work on reasoning. So when you have intellectual faith, the word of God has not become a part of you yet, like revelation does. And therefore you cannot fight by, uh, it cannot fight by itself. When, in, when faith is intellectual, it requires your reasoning to fight for it. That's the reason you may struggle with the question that is put before you. Okay, whether it's morally right or not. Enticing Spirits, paragraph 47. He says, therefore, if a man or woman could ever get their thoughts and their testimony and their lives, now watch this, we said we'd refer to this later. If man or woman could get their testimony, their lives so lined up with God, amen, until the channel of the Holy Spirit would be perfectly one with God, what would take place? If the man and woman could ever get, here's it again, lined up with where with freedom from their hearts, with faith from their innermost, many people come to the altar to be prayed for. They have intellectual faith. They confess their sins and join the church by intellectual faith. This is, this is amazing, saints. These statements are absolutely amazing. He says, they believe it in their heart, uh, their mind. So intellectual faith, they believe it in their mind. Right? That means they convince themselves that they believe, right? They believe it because they've heard it, Brother Bram says. They believe it because they know it's the best policy. But that's not what God looks at. He don't look at your intellectual faith. He looks on the heart. Where? On the inside. God. And when it comes from the heart, all things are possible then. Your confession meets up with your life. Your, your life speaks as loud as your confession does. But when your confession says one thing, your life lives another, there's something wrong somewhere. That's because you got intellectual faith and not faith from your heart. And that shows that outside here is a knowledge of God, but inside here is a demon of doubting. Brother Ram said, I believe in, you say, I believe in divine healing, but it's not for me. See? I, it could be so, but I don't believe it. Get it? Outside you say yes. Inside your conscience says no. That some scientific thing would prove that wasn't right. Prove it. Right? All right. This is a beautiful revelation to take hold of, saints. Intellectual faith is the faith of most Christians today. I mean, that statement, they believe it because they know it's the right policy. It's the best policy. That means... That means at the time, they're agreeing with what is being preached. They're agreeing with the, with the, the message <clears throat> community. They're agreeing with the way of the message. Because at that time, they know it's the right policy. They know it's the best policy. But they don't believe from the heart. Okay, so if we are not believing from the heart, we are going to get enticed into believing the wrong thing. Now, that's why we teach doctrine, to make sure you are lined up with God. What does it mean? You're teaching doctrine because you want people to get revelation. And that gives you the ability to fight back against doubt and reasoning. So which means doctrine must be right. That lines you up with scripture, that lines you up with God, that sets your, your revelation on the right path. So he brings it, Brother Maran brings it into divine healing. Now, it doesn't mean that if you believe in your heart, that you'll always get what you want. This is an important thing to understand, saints. Because people usually want God to deliver when they need healing from a terminal or dangerous disease. That's the only time people want God. Other than that, they live their lives however they want to, make their own decisions. The moment death is facing you, then it's God, what can you do for me? God, can you heal me of this cancer? God, can you heal me of this disease? I only need you now and I'm dedicating myself to you now when I'm in most need because my life is in peril. See? 
A true revelation of divine healing will not let you ask amiss. And I want to bring that to your attention. James chapter 4 verse 2 to 3 says, You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war and yet you have not because you ask not. So that's like, Basically, the, the, or the wisdom of the scripture is just amazing. It just takes my breath away. What it's saying is, you know, when you deeply desire something and you're desiring it so much, you're lusting after it. You're making it your ambition, your life's focus. You're willing to go the extra mile to wheel and deal in a sense of the scripture to kill and, and obtain by warring and fighting for something. And, and he's saying, there's an easier way. You just have to ask. And us doesn't mean, oh God, please can I have it? <laughs> that, is, that is a deeper meaning. It's speaking about having a different motive, a different path of achieving, right? A path of asking, not a path of fighting and contention. And then verse 3 says, you ask and then you receive not because you ask amiss. See, so some people think, well, now... God says we must ask for it. So here am I, I'm asking for it. And then he says, so in the way that you're asking for it, you don't receive what you want because you're not asking correctly, which tells us that there is a correct way to ask for something. Right? You ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. It means you are asking incorrectly because your motive is wrong because it's just to satisfy lusts. Right, in the evening messenger message, 1963, Brother Manam is praying. He says, I pray that you bless them now. And may this we pray before Lord, knowing and watching what we ask for. Because we don't want to ask amiss. We don't want to ask something that's just to make up words because we're talking to you. Oh, that's incredible. I tell you, listening to people pray in church, asking for something, praying to God for something. Question yourself. What do you want? What do you want from God? And when you get what you want, what are you going to do with it? And is it going to lead you into God's will? Or is it going to just satisfy your lust right now and have nothing to do with God's word whatsoever? See, when we ask from the position of lusting for something, we are definitely going to ask amiss. That means incorrectly. So even if we ask incorrectly, why can't God just give us what we ask for to lessen our suffering? Well, saints, that I just included that in my notes, but that's an immature way of asking or coming before God. God is not a being that exists to answer our needs and relieve our suffering. That's not what his relationship to us is about. God has a purpose and it concerns his word. If you really have a revelation and you know that the need that you have is going to directly affect the purpose of God positively, He will absolutely give it to you. Why should He give you something that's got nothing to do with His will? Just because you're lusting for it? That you really feel that you need it? But He knows that you don't need it? Why should He give it to you? Enticing Spurs, paragraph 51. The prophet saying, Notice when these kings, before they started out, they should have, before Jehoshaphat ever made an alliance with Ahab, he ought to have first said, let us pray and see what the will of the Lord is. And then you see, that's what I'm saying to you. Brother Maram said the same thing. You know, that's what I mean. You don't see this in the scripture. You don't see the full story. But here the prophet is saying, before he made an alliance with Ahab, that means before he even came down for the feast, Politically, he should never have aligned himself with this evil man. He ought to first said, let us pray. See what the Lord, Lord's will is. But the Bible says, give me a preacher. Give me a Christian. Give me a housewife. That's a Christian. Give me a farmer or a factory worker that will put God first in everything. I'll show you a man that will be successful in the spite of all the devil can put on him. He seeks God first. We must have first. But they didn't do it, he says. They were all clouded over because Ahab had a great bright kingdom. 
and he had done a whole lot of things, and he had his great fineries, his gold and his silver, and been a great successful man, yet an unbeliever. So saints, committed to prayer, wait for an answer from God before you do it. And remember, I've dealt with prayer before, uh, before with the church, and you know, it's not about continuously praying for something as if God didn't hear you the first time. When you say committed to prayer, that means, prayer means to ask from God. So if you're going to ask from God, before you even get to a spot where you're asking for it, question yourself. Why are you asking for it? What is your motive? Should you get it? What are you going to do with it? And if what you're going to do, if you know what you're going to do with it, is that going to be for the purpose of God or against the purpose of God? Is it going to work in favor of the church or against the church? Is it going to be good for your life, your family, or against your, your, your life and your family? These are the things you need to consider before you commit it to prayer. Amen. Paragraph 54, as we bring this to a close. He says, and that's where the world is today. That's where America stands today. That's where the churches stands today. We build some of the best churches was ever built. We've had some of the best Polish scholars we've ever had. We've taught some of the best theology and so forth and learned to sing like angels. Yet there's a weakness somewhere. There's a weakness because they've gone out after man's doctrine and enticing spirits instead of coming back to the word of God. They try to make things pattern like the world. They try to put shiny lights over it like Hollywood. Oh, saints, you can see this now. All right. Hollywood is the most enticing thing to the entire world right now. I mean, you can go to parts of China, the rural parts of China, the rural parts of Japan, uh, the rural parts of the East. Why am I choosing them? Because those people are the most... Um, um, the, the East is a part where they believe in Buddhism, and the law of karma, they believe in reincarnation. They have really ancient, deep-rooted beliefs and religions. And yet you go there, and those people want to be like Hollywood. That's incredible. Why would they want to be like Hollywood? They've got some of the most sophisticated religion and m morality and belief systems from long before the Western world ever came into civilization. That, that place, the East, was civilized long before the West was ever civilized. And yet, they all want to be like Hollywood? That's really going to strike you as odd, right? Hollywood must have some power. So what is it? It's enticing. Why? Because even though those people in the Buddhist countries, people who uh, observe Buddhism, the Chinese, the Japanese... And of course, some of it is Buddhism, others is ancestral worship and so on. Why are they so attracted? Why do they fall prey to Hollywood? Because even though they had that great belief they claim to have in God, they have lusts and desires which are being satisfied by Hollywood. That's why they are being derailed by that spirit. Now, just thinking of that, put that into that nature into the gospel, into preaching. When you have to preach and you want to get people to believe you and you're going to gloss it over, like that's what Brother Barnum is saying, with charisma, with Hollywood idea, with emotion, with American Pentecostalism, if you've got to behave like those television preachers, and try to be like those great denominations and talk like them and walk around like them and use a microphone like them, well then, you are appealing to a certain people. And if your people are jumping up and down and screaming and enjoying this, that's because they have a desire. They have a lust and you are satisfying that lust. 
and you have a real problem on your hand. Man's doctrine is man's ideas, saints, inspired by enticing spirits that's contrary to the word of God. And those enticing spirits are there because there's a desire for something. They are responding to that desire. That's where our weaknesses lie, right? Why? Because we're leaning to man's ideas, man's understanding. And as we close, I'm going to close with that with our title. Lean not to your own understanding. Proverbs 3 and verse 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Amen. He shall direct thy path. He'll give you direction. What is directing your path? He's going to show you his will. He's going to reveal to you his will. What you're going to do is acknowledge him in your life's paths, in your life's decision. Acknowledge him in your life, right? Do not lean, leaning to your own understanding is going to lead you to be enticed by spirits that are going to recognize that you have an agenda in your heart that is contrary to the word of God, contrary to the purpose of God. And you can be a believer who's still learning, still moving along the way. And if you are going to lean to your own understanding, this is the problem that you are going to face. Amen. Saints, this is just the foundation that we will begin with in the subject of enticing spirits. I trust that this can give us some good understanding, more understanding of our human nature and how we operate and why certain things in this life come against us to deceive us. I trust that you can understand and see why the scripture speaks the way it does and why the word speaks the way it does about enticing spirits. So may the Lord bless you, saints. Have a wonderful evening. May you share it with your loved ones and and fellowship around the word of God and be happy and content in the way God has revealed himself to us in these last days. For we are a great, privileged and blessed people in the eyes of God. And we should be thankful for all that he has done for us. May the Lord bless you. Until the next time. Amen.